Uh, next, we have our carrier panel uh, with Harvard Pilgrim, Anthem, Ambetter, Tufts, and Cigna. We are fortunate to have uh, top leadership from each of the organizations. Um, the audience is going to have a, an opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, there's some cards available, so if you do have any questions, uh, please fill out these cards and uh, pass them forward to uh, Don Gorman, who I have. There he is, right there. Um, the cards up there, or are these them? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to first start by just introducing uh, our participants. Uh, first, we have Dr. Bill Brewster, who's the vice president of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, New Hampshire market. Uh, we have Lisa Gurton, who's the president of Anthem, New Hampshire. Uh, we have uh, Jennifer Wagon, the president and CEO of Ambetter. Uh, we have Jerry Vaughn, who's the president of Tufts Health Freedom Plan. And we have Mark Butler, who's Northeast Market President for Cigna. Thank you all again for coming. And uh, they're, all of their bios are available uh, with the information that we have outside. Um, so if, if any of you would like to, to read up on, on their accomplishments, please uh, feel free to grab those. Um, we're going to jump right into the questions here. So uh, the, the first question is uh, for Dr. Bill Brewster and Harvard Pilgrim. Uh, generally, insurance is an industry that favors size and the associated economies of scale. Compared to a large national carrier, it would seem as though Harvard Pilgrim is disadvantaged. Please describe your relationship with United Healthcare and how re uh, remaining as an independent regional carrier could result in lower costs overall. Thank you. Uh, thanks for asking us to be part of this today. Thanks for all, to all of you for coming. And um, again, I only hope I can do as good a job as uh, was done in the prior presentation. Um, I, I'm still surprised they keep asking me back, but <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I um, understood the question and I understand how that bigger sometimes is better. I think one of the things that we bring to the market as a regional player is that we really are local um, and that we bring that value of have actually being local and having what we do fit the market that we're in. I, I think most of you understand that uh, we're in four states in Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. But each of us has a VP that runs each market and a market team that is very local. So what we do is, is really adjusted based on each market because even Maine and New Hampshire have different market segments, different market forces, different provider groups, and it lets us to really uh, work with them. We have United as a, an overlay and, an, and a partner that allows us to sell to businesses that have satellite offices across the uh, United States, and I think that helps us for those market segments that are on the bigger side. Um, really um, you know, work with them to be able to offer value outside of New England. I think one of the values, again, of being a regional player is that we really own what we, where we play and where we work. Um, we're part of those communities, but also we have teams like our pharmacy team. I, I don't know, those of you that are providers in the room, I know there are a bunch of you in here. Crises always happen about 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. When I was a physician and doing that, it always, you know, I'd be thinking about the weekend and getting out and my front desk would go, there's somebody really sick. Pharmacy questions, other issues around coverage. I had a uh, person who works for another payer whose daughter actually had insurance with us who had a crisis at 4.30 about a specialty drug they needed that weekend and we were able to, I could make a phone call down to our office speak to the second panel of our pharmacy team at 4.30 by 5 o'clock. We had an exception in place until the physician could get the, the information in that we needed to cover that. So I think we own that and we own our networks. If you're seeing somebody, if you're in New Hampshire and you need to go to Massachusetts or Connecticut or Maine, we, we own that network. We're contracted directly with those providers in all of the states so that we have those direct relationships and can work to, to make that work better. So I think it's really it's a, there's a value to us being a regional player in a, in a marketplace, doing what we do for the segments that we feel are our segments to work in. Excellent. Thank Thanks. you, Doug. Uh, the next question is for Anthem. Uh, Lisa, uh, is Anthem in opposition to most provider mergers? And can you identify <coughs> examples or evidence of pro provider consolidation that would make it virtually impossible to sell health insurance without paying high price demanded by a consolidated provider system? Okay, um, so he gets a softball and I get that, right? that's perfect. Um, well, you know what, I, I'll be honest, uh, Anthem is concerned about most um, potential mergers on the care delivery side and I would say that's based both on um, 
multiple independent national studies and analyses that um, are pretty emphatically demonstrate that prices go up substantially following you know, those consolidations, uh, but also on our own experience uh, inside of Anthem, both in this market and around the country. So I'll just, to answer your question, I'll highlight a few examples of, of both. Um, and some of it's very recent, so it was just this year that the Commonwealth Fund uh, published a report that showed that concentration on the delivery side pushed up hospital prices, physician prices, and not surprisingly, Affordable Care Act premiums, because as we always point out, uh, the cost of health insurance is directly tied to the underlying cost uh, of health care. There was something else interesting that happened this year that I think brought out an important aspect of this that doesn't always uh, get addressed, and that's um, Lee Moore Daphne, who's a, a professor at Harvard Business School, uh, testified to the House Committee on Energy and Commerce. And he had a couple of uh, important points. The first was that, in general, um, mergers on the delivery side do um, cause increases in price. But one of his specific points was that even mergers that span distinct markets, and this is kind of an important point, um, do drive up price. What, why is that important? Because often when you do an antitrust review of uh, two organizations coming together, the real focus is do they compete? in their own footprint. Would this reduce competition? And that, that's an important consideration. But I think Daphne's point was it's not the only one. Because even if those merging entities are in completely separate markets, you saw how much of insurance is purchased by employers. And employers have needs for a network that spans multiple markets in order to meet the needs of their employees. They can't have holes in the network. It's that fact, as Daphne pointed out, that creates a, a, a real increase in bargaining power, even if the organizations that are coming together uh, don't compete locally. Um, I, I think if you want to put that in very simplistic terms, if a system gets big enough and covers enough of a, of a market, you can get into a situation of sort of take it or leave it, um, you know, because employers don't want holes in, in the network. Um, in 2017, New Hampshire's own former Center for Public Policy Studies uh, urged caution, said there's robust literature that reduction in competition and hospital consolidation uh, result in increase in prices. And then I think, you know, we need only look south because Massachusetts is one of the most studied markets uh, because of years of, of pretty much unchecked growth uh, by partners. In, in fact, in um, I think it was 2014, the New York Times said that partners' expansion in mass actually should serve as a cautionary tale to other states about the risk of big hospital mergers and also, importantly, the limits of antitrust law to, to do anything about it once a dominant system uh, really takes hold. So, uh, you know, there's just lots of, of information available on that that you can access. There was a health policy committee that looked at uh, when Partners was looking to acquire South Shore and Hallmark, um, costs would go up by 23 to 26 million. So, you know, ultimately the AG in Massachusetts said enough, um, and now we know that Partners is looking to other markets like ours and, and Rhode Island. Um, so I'll stop there on sort of the uh, national study perspective and, and just cite a few Anthem examples. One of the most interesting markets for us to look at as an Anthem market is California, because Northern California is highly consolidated on the, on the delivery side, and Southern California is not. Uh, in the North, inpatient prices are 70% higher, outpatient 15 to 50% higher, and not coincidentally, ACA premiums are 35% higher in the North than in the South. Another um, recent study, we actually are, have an Anthem plan in Missouri, and a large hospital and a regional medical center merged. And we participated in a study to look at the prices before and after. Uh, these are real numbers. Inpatient before 1,200, after 2,500. Colonoscopy before $711, after 1,500. Maternity before 2,500, after 5,000. So with everything we, we heard earlier about the challenges of affordability, um, you know, I, I, I would ask how can we not be concerned? So, so generally speaking, um, th that's the basis of the concern that we have. Very good. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, the next question we have is for Ann Bender. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock is a large provider in the state with substantial integration. How do your negotiations with Dartmouth-Hitchcock differ from those with other providers? Great. And thank you again for having us here today. 
you know, I would say that from our perspective, each provider is unique. And while there are providers that range in size and scope and availability of services, we really take the opportunity to have that relationship with our providers individually. We've looked at over the past couple months and years, looking at the surge in behavioral health and substance use providers and the different types of modeling that we need to afford providers of that scale and size versus someone of the scale and size of Dartmouth. Clearly a provider that provides a wide scope and service, multi-regional presence, and then we're also looking at the evolution and integration of alternative payment models and how they can come together and meet providers where they are because an alternative payment model for Dartmouth may not be the same or effective alternative uh, payment method for a smaller provider that's in the community. So we take all of those pieces and parts and really approach our providers with a consistent package and understanding what their drivers are, how do we improve overall health outcomes of our members, and align on a compensation and negotiation plan that works best for both parties. That's great, Jennifer, thank you. Uh, next question is for Jerry and uh, Tufts. Have you faced unusual challenges from provider organizations that consider your relationship with the granted health providers favoring their com competitors? <clears throat> and has that increased the price paid to those non-granted health providers? Thank you for that question and good morning. Um, I'm really happy to be here and part of the panel this morning. So I would say that that question has been asked of me as I've been making my way around the state since I started with Tufts Health Freedom Plan in June. And I would say that um, I'm happy to report that we have all 26 acute care hospitals um, in our provider network. I would say that our network matches our competition, and so I'm not at all concerned with network adequacy. That being said, I think the, the, the question is fair, um, and, and I, would, I would speak a little bit to the, the unique arrangement that we have through Tufts Health Freedom Plan, and not sure if you're all aware of it. But it is a joint venture and it is a partnership between a well-established health plan out of Massachusetts Tufts Health Plan and then Granite Health, which is comprised of five hospital health care systems. And I think we have the unique opportunity to leverage that collaborative governance structure to really look at the marketplace and assess and understand exactly what the needs are for each one of the unique communities in, in New Hampshire. And I would say that we are, that the learning that we're obtaining through that, through this model is helping us understand how, to, how we need to partner with providers across the state. Early signals are, are suggesting to me that there is strong support and engagement from providers across New Hampshire, and they truly see us as a viable option and a sustainable option. I think that when you look at competition, whether it be on the provider side or the carrier side, I think that the market is better served with more competition. We've been able to deliver a, um, a lower price point for the entire market, specifically in small group. And when, when I look at, we've got almost 950 sm accounts, largely in small group, where we have been able to provide an affordable um, coverage option for their, for their employees. So I would say that we're embracing uh, providers across the state, and I think they're embracing us as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next question is for Cigna and Mark. Thank you. Uh, pharmacy benefit manager business practices have received a lot of scrutiny lately. Does Cigna believe carriers need to take more control of these operations, including dispensing of medications? Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, everybody, for attending here today. Thank you for having us. Uh, enjoy speaking with this panel as we did here the last couple of years. So uh, probably just a level set, uh, Cigna historically and continues to own their own pharmacy benefit manager. So we, we own that component. Um, and most of you probably are aware we've entered into an agreement uh, recently to buy Express Scripts. So we will be, uh, intention is to expand that capability. Can't elaborate a lot on that because we're a publicly traded company, <laughs> but uh, we do expect to close that transaction by the end of the year. So um, I interpreted the question, Commissioner, uh, in terms of dispensing. We have home delivery services that we provide um, through uh, Cigna Pharmacy today. Uh, it's designed to be a more affordable choice. It's designed to be a more convenient uh, option that's there. So uh, when we think about uh, access and ease and um, fulfilling prescription medications, uh, we have a lot of data that suggests uh, recurrent hospital stays occur because of medicine non-compliance. So when we think about uh, access, oftentimes people can't get out and actually get the medication uh, or they take half of it, they don't finish it. 
uh, working in the Cigna Pharmacy benefit business, uh, home delivery makes it convenient, but we also have folks that outreach will explain uh, how the medication works, make sure that people are complying and taking the prescription uh, to its completion because it's, uh, its clinical effectiveness certainly is gonna be much better. So I think when we, we look into the future, and we saw a little bit earlier today, we see some of those trends in the drug area coming down. Um, at Cigna, at least, we will continue to own that component uh, of the healthcare dollar as we go forward. Uh, and we're looking to make that experience from a customer and a user perspective uh, as easy and as compliant as possible as we go forward. That's great, Mark. Thank you very much. All right, uh, question number two for uh, Dr. Bill here. Uh, what is unique about the potential partners opportunity and why would a relationship with a system seen as expensive result in lower costs overall? Wouldn't there be cost implications with more referrals going to partners hospitals? So I was kind of waiting for the next softball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there another question? No. Let me see, I'll give you anthems. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, you know, again, I, I was expecting the question. I've had the question a lot, like Jerry said. You know, you go around, you meet with people, and the question is, what about partners? What about partners? And I go, what partners are you talking about? <laughs> big, big P partners, little P partners. Yeah. Um, we, we have a lot of partners, um, and we are always looking, and, and you know, to answer the question, there is not, no done deal. Anything we do with any partner, big P, little P, um, will bring value to the state of New Hampshire. We're around cost, around quality. Um, and so, you know, again, if, if I knew the answer, if I knew what was going to happen with them, I would tell you. But we're looking to work with them like we do with every partner. We have a very, very successful, as people in the audience here today, they're in partnership with us in Benevera Health. It has been driving down costs by any metric that you want to look at, whether it's readmits, ER visits, whatever. We do this across our membership. We identify people early, and we try to keep them healthy. And one of the things when we go into partnerships, whether it's with Elliott, whether it's with Dartmouth or uh, Frisbee, or one of our other one-off pilots that we do with a lot of people around bundles, around ER utilization or whatever, when we look at those partnerships, one of the things as a provider that I think I bring, again, that value to the table is to say, well, what's, we have to have something about what's in it for them. Us driving down their direct revenue has to come back someplace if they are still doing the work to keep people healthy. So how do they pay their bills? Uh, and how do we share in that um, efficiency that we develop? Um, and I think that that's, again, will have to be part of whether it's the big P partners discussion or whatever. There is no ability for me to pay more and more in premium every year. Or as when I owned a business, for me to pay able to uh, pay more and more as one of the biggest line items they have, or as a uh, partner out there, as a provider partner, to pay more and more bad, you know, to absorb more and more bad debt. I know Sharon had mentioned that earlier. So these partners, whether it's the Big P partnership or uh, other partnerships around Benevera, we're looking for those Benevera-like partnerships where we can find efficiencies, where we can legally align to actually drive down costs. Um, direct revenue for people being sick and actually have providers be able to succeed and survive when they keep their members healthy. Thank you very much. All right, we have a second question for Anthem, Lisa. Uh, do you feel that the Anthem business strategy is more or less focused on insurer-provider integration than your competitors? And I guess why or why not? Um, well, I, I would say um, our focus has been on, on partnership, not, not ownership, and uh, collaboration built around value-based payment and aligned incentives has been really important um, to us, and we have an approach that allows us to enter into those sorts of arrangements with um, the largest systems like Dartmouth, multiple hospitals represented in the room. Um, it would, you know, risk arrangements and uh, bundled payments and the like, all the way down to uh, the smallest independent practice. What I would say is um, a little bit different uh, about the approach and the focus we've had is it's really focused on three things that we believe are really critical to improving the system and the performance of the system. Um, the first being fortifying primary care, which has really gotten sort of de-emphasized and devalued over the years. Um, helping physicians stay independent, I'm going to talk a little bit about that one, 
and then of course rewarding value, not volume. We know that the, the fee for service approach that has been used in, in healthcare financing and delivery for years has some real unintended consequences, and that's where the pay for value becomes so important. Um, but, but to talk about why those things are so vital and so central to what we've been working on, um, it, it starts with the fact that independent doctors, especially PCPs, are truly a vanishing breed. Um, nationally, only about 30% of doctors are independent, i.e. not an employee of a hospital or a large system. And I'll, I'll guest in up at uh, Dartmouth Med School from time to time, and I'll sit with the students, and I'll ask them, you know, where do you think you're going to practice when you get out? To a person, no one says they're going to be independent. They don't even think it's a viable option anymore. Um, I'm not going to hang out a shingle and go it alone. So um, this is a real issue. So so why why does it matter so much? Uh, MedPAC um, has has said that as hospital employment of physicians has grown, um, services are migrating from office settings into hospital outpatient departments. Um, and the same thing was reported in the Journal of Medical Economics. So their statement was, as, as PCPs become employees of a hospital, they're more likely to send tests and therapies and other services in-house rather than to other resources. So, so sort of plainly stated, um, the system begins to contain or control those referrals, creating a bit of a closed funnel. I have to caveat this to say I understand that. I understand the pressures on the delivery side that make that something that they want to do. Um, and we're not sort of the enemy of those systems, but if you look at what happens to cost, um, the average uh, hospital-based price for those services, those migrating services, can be double or more compared to independent community-based options. So things like lab and imaging, colonoscopy therapies, uh, there's variation in general, but there's variation by site. So JAMA reported that as a result of, of that, the average co total cost for a patient of an employed PCP is 10 to 19 percent higher than the total cost for the patient of an independent PCP. Um, again, that, that's something that we can't ignore. So one of our focus areas has been trying to make being independent a viable option uh, by providing tools and, and support and information and, frankly, reimbursement to the primary care physicians that are independent so that that remains a viable option for those who, who choose to practice that way. I think that's probably the most differentiating aspect of what we've been focusing on. Very good. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, next question is uh, question two for Ambetter and Jennifer. Uh, does Ambetter believe the integration of payer and pharmacy dispensing has the potential in to increase drug costs or medical costs overall? Well, it's certainly a heightened topic of discussion, I believe, <laughs> both um, locally and nationally. And, and certainly, you know, we believe and I believe that integration and alignment from a pharmaceutical perspective with the health plan and health insurance industry can only improve total cost of care. So as Mark had alluded to earlier with the experience at Cigna, when we look at drug cost and we look at the blockbuster drugs coming out and Hep C as an example, Dr. Brewster and I were talking about that a little earlier today, and the migration and evolution of how Hep C has changed just over the last 18 months with new medications coming out, you know, having greater alignment between pharmaceutical and PBM services and health plan can only improve that total cost of care as we all work together to improve health outcomes. I think often, too, that from a pharmacy perspective, that, that is often for us potentially the first time we interact with a new member. So they're going while we're trying to outreach to them to welcome them to our health plan or orient them to services, they're accessing <coughs> pharmacy services. So any alignment that we can do and build upon what we have today will improve those health outcomes and allow us to contribute even in a more efficient way. In addition to that, we're seeing a lot of great success with integration of medication therapy management programs, gaps in care, looking for opportunities to interact with folks as they fill or stop filling medications. What does that do to ED utilization, inpatient utilization, and outpatient utilization, and those drivers presented earlier by Jen and her team? So we think there's great opportunity to improve total cost of care, and that's really what we're focused on. That's excellent. Thank you very much. All right, Cigna has uh, the gold star two questions in a row here, so <laughs> we'll start with uh, this first one, Mark. Thank you. Cigna was quoted in a recent uh, Wall Street Journal article describing negotiation strategies by large hospital delivery systems that prevented carriers from developing limited networks. Can you discuss this problem and how provider consolidation could make it worse? 
So there's a lot in that question, um, and I think philosophically uh, staying with the quote that we, we did make in the journal is that uh, what we believe in is we don't believe any significant system should be able to limit competition or uh, drive pricing. Having said that, um, I think the panel's touched on a number of areas. The complexities inside of the uh, hospital and physician systems today uh, first and foremost, uh, can't be looked at really on a state-specific basis any longer. So uh, we have plans uh, and delivery systems down in Massachusetts that are going cross-border, uh, down into Rhode Island, up into New Hampshire. And I think the way we should think about that is uh, they're trying to define their uh, geographic catchment area that they want to deliver services. Uh, secondarily, they're looking to be um, price competitive and, and, and deliver uh, access to care, okay? It's debatable whether they're becoming too big, not too big, and what the overall cost in the market is of that. But I think the real grounded point here is that um, you have to look at it really not at a state-specific basis any longer, but an aggregate basis. Now, having said that, so why is size so important? So if you look at sort of the dynamics of, have taken place in the national landscape, the ACA, you look at um, the, the different dynamics of what employers are looking for. Uh, Dr. Brewster alluded, you know, whether they're looking for specialty services to be directed at certain areas. Everybody is really sort of transitioning right now to what do they want to be in the future. Okay, so that's a lot of the positional piece there. The question is, is if we negotiate with them and everybody has a, a different approach and we take different approaches based on the systems, the question will become, um, can we deliver an effective price, okay, for the employers? Number two, and I will uh, talk about this very frequently, the employers are ultimately going to determine how much they're going to pay for what. If you look at New England right now, we still are uh, largely an area that everybody wants every doctor, every hospital in. As the employers begin to compete in a global economy, and they have only X amount of dollars to put towards health care, okay, there will be an intersection point, okay, we see it sometimes with different network configurations, but they're going to say, we want these systems, we don't want those systems. That will be the future at some point. We are not there yet. So we have the dynamics of what will the employers ultimately buy and accept? How do you balance access and costs? And then you've got the footprint that's ever changing that goes across states now with the delivery system is trying to position themselves as they go forward. So to sort of bring it back around to what the question was, and I think you have to answer the question on the context of understanding the landscape that we're operating in. Um, do we believe anybody should go in and be able to limit competition and set pricing? Uh, philosophically, no. Okay, we, we don't like to do that. We believe, I think similar to other folks on the panel here that uh, competitiveness should be driven by delivering high value, okay, competitive cost, and be based on really a, a value-based delivery uh, payment model. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Um, and then uh, the question three, assuming uh, you believe provider consolidation can drive up prices, do you pay the largest delivery systems the most for similar services? So uh, I probably covered a little bit of this in, in what I just spoke about, but um, very similar to, to what Jennifer said. Every negotiation is a freestanding negotiation. So um, I don't look at things as are they bigger so they get more, okay, are they smaller so they get less. We, we try to draw a balance of market competitiveness um, and fairness. I know there were some questions that came up on, you know, how do you reimburse appropriately for services rendered? Okay, how do you set the right reimbursement level? How do you reimburse for the complex services that are rendered, okay? So there's a balancing that goes on in that. So um, what I would tell you is, uh, I've been doing this for 40 years now, that the dynamics in the negotiations with the systems are very different today than they were even 10 years ago. Uh, and what do I mean by that? There's much more collaboration. I think everybody is trying to create a situation where uh, they can be appropriately reimbursed for the services they deliver. We're trying to, as a, um, a health services company, to reimburse at what we think are appropriate levels that will address the needs of the employers uh, that we serve. 
And I think we're sort of in a changing world right now. We're moving away from fee for service. We're moving into more value-based arrangements. Um, that puts a lot of strain on both sides of the system. But uh, I think we're making progress, sir. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, I think I uh, passed over one question that I'm going to come back to for Tufts and Jerry. Um, what kind of provider consolidation usually drives costs, price utilization the most, vertical or horizontal? And if you can, uh, some examples. So I, I would say it, it really depends. And to um, tee off a little bit what Lisa shared, I think historically there haven't been many data points that would suggest that uh, provider consolidation and horizontal integration has really brought costs down. I think that if you look at market to market, um, there's enough data that would suggest it, it's actually going the other way. As uh, providers uh, affiliate, merge, and acquire, I think that uh, there is a, a pressure to raise cost as a result of it as a result of it because typically these newly acquired providers fall under the, the existing contracts that are in place with those systems. Um, so I would say that I, I don't see many examples where, we, where we've seen that cost has gone down. When I think about vertical integration, although let me just say this, I think lab may be an example. I was thinking about this question last night. Or if you look at lab and you look at, um, in, and I think it's similar market to market, you've got LabCorp and you have Quest who have been able to acquire very small independent um, clinical labs. And as a result of that, they've now got massive scale that they can produce a product that is really a commodity at that point. And as a result of that, they have driven costs down. Um, they've been able to leverage their technology and their, um, their operational efficiencies to be able to offer um, a lower price point to the marketplace. So I would say that that would be an example um, of where where price has gone down or as a result of integration. When I think about vertical integration, and I think um, a couple of my panelists have also shared this, it, providers are um, challenged with the reimbursement models that are changing um, dramatically. And I think while we're all talking about the shift to value, the underlying payment structure is not set up that way yet. And so in order to um, achieve value across a continuum, you have providers that are acquiring DME and home health and skilled nursing. And I think the result of this is going to take years for us to probably see any type of um, cost efficiencies. But the goal is really to uh, develop value across a continuum and be able to control that. When you think about uh, on the provider side, what drives cost is IT. Many health systems across the country are, are now, they all have interoperability was the buzzword about three to five years ago. And I think most of them are moving to Epic or Cerner, that's the Coke and Pepsi in the EMR world, and that's considerable. Um, uh, that's a huge cost structure that needs to be accounted for, and they need to do that to be able to support a new model of care and transform um, the delivery system because the old system and the existing system is really still siloed based on a FIFA service uh, reimbursement platform. That's great. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, so those are all the questions that uh, we had as a department. Uh, did anybody pass any questions oh, down yeah. to Don? Excellent. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Take it from here, I guess. Uh, I thought there was a wireless microphone. It's fine. I can take it from here if that's okay. Ah, here it is. Okay, so I did receive a few questions here. Um, the first one talks about, you know, you guys have all talked about provider consolidation. This question is specifically about uh, mergers of insurance companies, and they point out that the Department of Justice over the last few years has successfully sued to stop anti-competitive mergers between four of the five largest insurance companies. The questioner also goes on to cite a health affairs article that's that, uh, I'm not, I haven't fact checked this at all, but basically they say that um, health insurance carrier consolidation has been more of a driver in terms of premium uh, increases than providers. So, and they ask that each of the panelists discuss that. Who's first? I'll, I'll start it off. So um, maybe I'll, I'll start maybe with the merger and acquisition piece first, and then maybe make a 
comment. So um, I think when you look at the market, and I, I think uh, Jerry just said it best here. So you have a system that exists today uh, that historically was done one way, okay? And, and I'm talking about the delivery side right now. Uh, there's huge investments that they're making to uh, reinvent how they do business, how they align philosophies inside of the physician panels that are in those delivery systems, and then we've talked about really sort of geographic expansion. Um, none of that comes easy, none of that comes uh, inexpensively. So if you look at the payer side, and I'll speak specifically to Cigna, um, as we move into value-based reimbursement arrangements, as we sort of continue to support traditional fee-for-service arrangements, as we see the demographics begin to shift on employers, and I, I use this uh, statement, by uh, 10 years from now, 80% of the labor force will be millennials. So think about how that particular uh, segmentation of people purchases, desires information, desires the transparency of it, the quickness, they want it delivered through a handheld. So when we think about the business that we're in, um, it's a very complicated business in its simplest form, both for the physician partners and for the um, uh, companies like Cigna to continue to evolve and provide services, infrastructure, support for what is going to be needed in this business five years, ten years from now. Now that could be again back to how we reimburse providers, how we send information out. Um, Dr. Brewster made a comment, you know, when we look at New England, more and more employers don't have their entire employee base here. We're a, a global company. We operate in 50 states and, and 36 countries. Um, we have to be able to deliver services on a platform and an infrastructure that can service all of those individuals. So as we sort of look at, um, you know, premiums charged, reinvestment of that capital, there's tremendous support structures that go into that and will continue to go into that as we sort of work and evolve with the, with the delivery systems and really what the consumers of tomorrow will want. And I would say building on to Mark's comments, I, I would say that Mark's correct that the expectations are changing. The expectations from our members, our providers, and our customers. So when you think about you know, our providers are seeking help with analytics to support the value-based contracts that we're trying to partner on and our alternative payment models. Well, there's data and data needs to be interchanged with folks and how do you create that scale and technology footprint to afford those that functionality out to the market. Members, to Mark's point, are expecting a more mobile experience, so infrastructure and technology that's needed to support those activities. And from a customer perspective, whether that's the customer is the state or an employer group, their expectations and the games are, are increasing, right? So we need to invest and have scale. And I think that part of the consolidation we're seeing in the industry is, is aligning around the ability to have that scale, reinvestment in tools and technology and analytics to help to support total cost of care and health outcomes. So I'm just going to jump in quickly also, and I, I would agree with both the prior speakers, but um, one of the things that I think we've really looked at is that we've really thought of ways to have it not be us and them, so it isn't just uh, providers um, getting bigger and bigger or payers getting bigger and bigger, um, but we've really tried to, again, integrate so that it's not, uh, it's not them or us, it's us together. Um, I think the other thing that we've thought of and continue to think of is um, diversification across different market segments. So uh, I think about 10 years ago or so, we acquired Health Plans uh, Inc., or HPI, which does a lot of our self-insured business, we, uh, and MedWatch, which is a care management company, Trestle Tree, which is a counseling and coaching uh, team. and. Um, again, for size, I mean, I think people think of us as little. We cover almost 1.3 million lives um, uh, in our Harvard Pilgrim business, but with all of our other subsidiaries across a diverse market uh, segment and different product lines, uh, we cover over 3 million, touch 3 million people in the States. So um, again, I think that's been our plan as far as um, growing across the years. I would say to add comment to that as well, you know, I think insurance carriers are like other um, industries in that we you know the cost of technology to be able to be nimble and responsive to market needs 
um, is, is been dramatic over the last couple of years. And I think that um, in order for carriers to be able to compete and offer product uh, to the marketplace, scale and operational efficiencies are equally important on the carrier side. I think for, for Tufts Health Freedom Plan, some of the examples where we've tried to be um, creative and innovative are the relationship and partnership that we have with the Granite Health Systems, uh, as well as Northeast Delta Dental. You know, where where we are responding to market needs and market demands. That said, I think that um, as as carriers consolidate and some of these mergers and acquisitions continue to take hold, I think it's um, it is it's it's concerning for a smaller carrier. Uh, like Tufts Health Freedom Plan to be able to uh, compete around some of those operational efficiencies that are being gained by that. So I would say that you know it's important for us to be able to be responsive to the marketplace, uh, embrace and engage with our providers, and offer a price point that is attractive and sustainable. So to bring up the caboose, um, I will I will <laughs> say that um, I I understand the pressures. Um, that exist throughout healthcare financing and delivery. I, there, I don't believe there's a there's a bad guy here. Each participant in the system is looking at what do I need to do in this incredibly pressured environment, and the pressure comes from the affordability and what we just saw. So I, there, I don't believe there's any malintent. I think what what it comes down to is sometimes what's good for a participant in the system may or may not be good for the system as a whole. In general, I think that the Big horizontal mergers, especially when you're talking about big players like an Anthem and a Cigna, get an awful lot of attention. They just do. Um, I think, back to the question about horizontal and vertical integration, uh, there are a lot of much smaller scale things that happen under the radar every day that I personally believe have even more power uh, to, to ultimately drive up cost. And, you know, a, a simple example might be a, a small independent physical therapy practice that gets purchased by a hospital and, and overnight the charges may start to get billed as um, you know at hospital rates with a facility fee attached. That's not going to make the Wall Street Journal um, in, in the way that a large insurer might, but it's real. And again, there are reasons for that. No one's out to be the, the sinister bad guy, but I think we see those, those costs. Um, I think if you study the reasons for the things we're talking about, the cost variation, we talked about the ability of a quest to, um, as one example, of bringing down the cost of a commodity service like lab. And when I sit and talk to hospitals or the hospital association, they'll say, but they don't have the same cost structure burden we do. Of course they can meet a better price. And what I say is in a market where over half of the customers are self-insured, with already the highest deductibles in the nation, there may be very valid reasons for the cost differences, but our customers don't care. They tell us they can't afford to care anymore. And so what we've really been trying to do is help consumers engage very differently in understanding those cost variations and give them the tools and the information and, frankly, the incentives uh, to pay attention to that. Not because there's, again, something sinister going on, but because something in this whole cost structure has to give. So I, I think there's a reason that the big mergers get the attention and the other stuff doesn't. I think the motivations for all participants to look at coming together are similar when you get right down to it. It's the investment costs of technology uh, and the opportunity for scale. Thank you very much. Um, these next ones sort of touch on what you're talking a little bit about. Um, this is about cost transparency and transparency in general. The first one talks about the payer provider relationships and whether or not the carriers are going to plan to promote transparency to ensure that employers and consumers understand those relationships. And the second part has to do with cost um, transparency and whether or not the tools that are out there are contributing to any of the trends in the insurance market and will engagement by the consumer uh, bring the cost down. I, I, could, oh, well, I was going to say, it sort of just builds on what I was, was <laughs> just bringing up. Um, I, I think it, it has to. Um, I, I think that, you know, we know we've got the, the department's tool, the public use data set, which presents sort of an aggregate view. Um, and I know Anthem, and I believe others as well, have made their own proprietary tools available that actually is able to use specific benefit plan specific, contract negotiated rate specific tools that allow people to understand their expected cost uh, for various services at, at different sites of care. 
Um, so that's, that's one thing. People need a way to know, and I think that's an important priority for us. But they need a reason to care. And you could argue that the big deductibles in, the, in and of themselves are a reason to care. Uh, but we find it, it actually takes a little bit more than that. So in our, instant, uh, in our case, um, benefit plans that are site sensitive, that where the, the out-of-pocket cost tracks with the overall cost that will be incurred when that site is used. Um, programs like uh, Smart Shopper, which are actually giving people incentive checks when they do the shopping uh, and go to the more cost-effective, high-quality site. I mean, these, uh, both of those programs are so important to us that they're embedded in our standard, fully insured, large and small group uh, benefit programs at this point, and, and all of them are producing strong, positive returns on investment. Uh, we just have to help people understand that variability that exists and make informed choices. And they are choices. You can still choose to do whatever you want, uh, but the cost should track, I believe, accordingly uh, based on those choices that you make. So I, I think that is really probably one of the most critical things we can do right now in partnership with our consumers uh, to try to help with cost. Maybe I'll add a, a quick comment on that. I, I agree with everything Lisa said there, but um, again, at Cigna, so we our, our profile, and you saw it in uh, New Hampshire, is largely self-funded. So employers have a desire um, because it's a self-funded dollar for people to make better shopping decisions. So we have full transparency tools uh, because we own every component of the healthcare dollars, and I, when I say own it. Um, they're our own proprietary companies. So I mentioned earlier, we have our own pharmacy benefit manager, we have our own dental company, uh, core medical, behavioral. So why that's significant is we have transparency tools, um, national tools that are out there that support cost transparency around each of those components, which are very important. That's number one. The challenge, and every employer will tell you this, is that with the tools out there, um, number one, how do you get people to use them? And then once they use them, are we sure that they understand them? Okay. And again, uh, where we're moving to from a, a model perspective um, is we now have products and services that are available to actually uh, provide, I'll call it really at a concierge <coughs> level, uh, the ability to help individuals go in, use these tools, help them navigate, help them pick a provider, help them uh, understand uh, an actual cost estimate that they get. Um, and, and make uh, the right informed choice. So as we go forward, um, I think we'll begin to see, uh, at least we believe, uh, much more intense focus on that customer, the user, um, and then uh, maximizing the tools through the usage of them, not so much that they don't exist, but how do you get the utilization of them up higher to make more informed choices. And I would agree with both Mark and Lisa and what they've said so far. We have, um, certainly there's a state website. Um, I. I don't know if they track, if you all track how much people use and any idea of who it is that's using it. I think there's a lot of us data walks that are out there using it from the insurance companies, kind of looking and seeing what's going on. But again, for a day-to-day -day person in my life, I'm not sitting around going, I'm bored and I need something to do. Let me go on a website <laughs> and uh, check things. And often I'm listening to my doc and, and then it sounds like peanuts and wah, wah, wah. You know, even though I'm a physician, now they've said I have something and I have to go get some tests done and here's where you go. So. Um, we do have something called Reduce My Cost. It's, again, very, it's incents people to actually go uh, to some place that might be less expensive. We have nurses who actually staff those calls, so they actually will work as a clinician, somebody who's clinically trained to work with the provider to help transition someone. Um, and I think, as you know, Mark said, you know, the self-insured business that we have, people are very concerned about that, and I think some of the larger groups will have such great HR teams that they will daily, not just at the health fair when we enroll some employee, but throughout the year reinforce that with people. I think we have to have that help to say, okay, there is this reduce my cost, we'll actually pay you for making the call. There are choices, you have a deductible, a lot of this is your money. But it's constantly reminding about people with choices, working with the HR, and we also have Benevera on the, it, it's, it's so different across the marketplace as to the help that employees have and members have. When you're an individual, you don't have an HR department, you are the HR. Or a small group that might have three people and the CEO of the company that's you know making whatever it is that they make for a product is more concerned about that. And so we have our Benevera team that actually notice these patterns of high cost, util, inefficient, site of service, like Lisa said, 
extent it's just like why would you go there for that kind of care um, going to the ER for a physical um, and basically um, our Benavera team will work with those people to say you know you have alternatives and give them a choice that they can do uh, the next time uh, to help train them as they get used to having insurance even can I make a comment on um, that question as well? Because I think it's important. Uh, our experience and what we've been seeing both in Massachusetts and New Hampshire is about 5%, 5 to 7% of patients, consumers actually tap into the transparency tool. And I think what's unique about healthcare is that um, when consumers or patients are shopping for a product or a service, it's not in isolation, and I think we need to be careful with what could be an unintended consequence of, of transparency. Hopefully, transparency will drive costs down, and that the market will be competitive, and providers will actually see what their price point is relative to their peer group or their competition. That would be the ultimate goal. I think what we need to be careful is that these do not drive further fragmentation in healthcare, because I think if you access a service outside of your local health system where your physician does not have access or communication with that provider or that, that other health care provider, I, I think it could ultimately drive cost in a different way. And we've seen this take place where a member or a consumer may have labs done at an, at an independent lab, and then when they go and see their provider back in their healthcare system, they order the labs again because there's a, there's, a, there's a timeliness that doesn't occur. And depending on how IT integrated the healthcare system is, it can cause fragmentation in, in, across the continuum. And I think just to close that one out, not to repeat anything that <laughs> anyone already said, but I think member engagement is critical and we've talked about that. I think the other piece of it too is really leveraging our value-based contracts to push transparency to our providers as well. And we've seen a really great uh, uptick in our new you know, our new programs and our provider engagement around making those decisions as we push data to our providers and if they're not aligned to a particular place, making that decision and helping members guide them through that process to make smart decisions. I think that transparency piece also encompasses our provider network as well and sharing data with our providers. Time for one more? Sure. Uh, this next one asks the panel, how are you working to support independent providers? Lisa mentioned earlier in her discussion about uh, cost being 10 to 19 percent lower for unaffiliated independent providers and this question is about how you guys are working to support those independent providers so i'll start if you, you want to start oh, good. you're the physician why don't you start <laughs> <laughs> you said you started first go okay. ahead um, so clearly a, a key focus for us and an important part of the the care delivery system as our community providers and non-affiliated providers and certainly, you know, our approach has been to, again, meet providers where they are. Some of the providers that we work with are really grasping and, and interested in technology. I can't afford the technology myself, but how can you provide data to me to help influence decision making? We've also been very deliberate about not just looking at large regional providers for value-based contracts, but creating value-based contracts that can meet our small and independent providers, also within subspecialties, so our OB networks. How do we leverage value-based contracts there? How can we look at behavioral health differently? How can we look at our SUD providers and the SUD community that has become more and more um, you know, robust within the last 12 months? How do we engage providers and really meet them where they are and provide value where we can? We have infrastructure that we can push around data and analytics so they don't have to invest in that. And we've really been trying to be deliberate about how can we be helpful in the care continuum and not just be someone who's paying claims and you know, providing prior authorization, but how do we really transform ourselves to be more of a valued partner to our community-based providers? And I, I, I would agree with everything you just said. I think that there's so many places that we can work, and we, we do work with different independent providers, whether it's a uh, mental health center, uh, whether it's an independent orthopedic practice, um, uh, we do bundles, you know, with independents. We try to design uh, shared savings programs where we actually uh, work with um, smaller organizations. And I think one of the toughest things about New Hampshire, and one of the great things about New Hampshire, is we have a lot of small, not only just independent, but very small provider groups that, in aggregate, don't have a lot of membership with one particular payer. It makes it really difficult to design a risk contract to get them to say, sure, share risk on. 200 patients when one of them getting sick or having an, an NICU baby is going to drive that contract. So we work on 
developing menus where our providers can actually pick from a menu of choices so they can align with what they're already doing and what they're doing with another payer to get paid for quality work. Um, and then around substance use, we just gave out a bunch of grants for small organizations throughout the state that aren't classic clinic clinicians that can build an e &M code to actually help them do the work that they're doing around prevention and other things that might fall out of where we normally as an insurance company would be able to play and actually subsidize and support some of those initiatives that they're working with um, across the state. So I'll say for Tough South Freedom, we're still an emerging carrier. We're growing in the marketplace. Um, and for us, I think we look at the independent physician market almost similar to that of the employed. So it's a relatively seamless experience, and we're trying to make ease of use with us um, as a platform uh, to, to assist them, knowing that uh, they've, they're challenged with, as you said, analytics, technology, reporting. Our goal is, uh, you know, we've got some focus specifically on primary care, but I would say that it's really no different uh, whether it be a, an independent physician or an employed physician. I think that our goal and our foundation is to tr really try and engage them around value. Um, and provide supporting reporting to be, for them to be able to leverage in, in, and activate on that. So um, I'll give New Hampshire credit going all the way back to the medical home um, pilot. Uh, good results were seen across the board. Some of the strongest results were seen in the independent practices. That has, um, that's consistent with what we're seeing in our enhanced personal health care program where we see really all participants producing some really impressive results on cost and quality, uh, but the very strongest um, are still the independents with costs 11% lower than that program's average. So it, it's still there. Um, how do we support it? I think you've heard it's about tools and information, um, reimbursement. One of the most important things is decoupling um, reimbursement from that 15 minutes when you're seeing a patient uh, in, in your office, which uh, you, know, you don't stop to think about, but that was really the only reimbursable event in a practice previously. And so now, with a monthly care management fee, completely decoupled from that, we're allowing smaller practices to have a new stream of revenue to invest in the things they need to to do that total care management. Um, and also giving them more insights and tools into uh, what's going on with their patient population so that they can do a better job and be successful in those value-based arrangements. I'd make just one closing comment um, because I agree with everything. I, I think when you listen to the panel, uh, there's a couple things that I, I think are very clear. A, there's a lot of listening going on on the carrier side of things. So, uh, and two, it's a very complex business. Okay, so you, you heard about some of the challenges of trying to do value-based reimbursement with a, with a small uh, physician practice, okay, challenge. Um, so from Cigna's perspective, uh, we're doing a lot of the work that uh, takes place on the analytics side. Uh, we have 240 collaborative arrangements nationally. We have 30 collaborative arrangements inside of New England. Uh, we have nine of those that exist inside of New Hampshire. They're anywhere from large systems to independent physician collaboratives. There's some very creative work uh, we're getting involved with over in the state of Vermont um, that I think potentially has some uh, cachet that carry over into other states in New England. Point really being is that as you think about sharing analytics, you're sharing data, uh, the goal really is to drive the lowest trends that we can possibly drive <coughs> from a total medical cost management. And I'll underscore there, when we think about cost, and we think about cost of the future, think about it in terms of total medical cost. That's how a patient consumes, it's how they pick their place to go, um, it's working with providers to really reimburse them based on value, affordability, and quality. So I think, um, again, as we listen to the panel, um, I hope you can sense that there's a lot going on in the space. It's complex, uh, but there's a lot of good work being done across the board. Well, thank you, Don, and uh, for, I want to thank all the panelists for participating. I really appreciate it.